coming up on Nightline SA edition. Go, you Christ! All aboard for the AFL invasion. John Howard targets Kim Beasley with a GST taunt and medicine at its miraculous best. We've booked you in for this amazing hand transplant. Good evening, South Australia. I'm Deanna Williams. Welcome to Nightline. Making news tonight, all aboard, the Melbourne invasion gains momentum. A battle building on two fronts, the GST and jobs. And a surgical sensation, the world's first hand transplant. Also tonight, signs of an interest rate cut as early as next week. But first, it's grand final day minus two and counting. The Crows leave for Melbourne tomorrow in the quest for a second consecutive AFL Premiership. And thousands of fans are already on their way amid news that a few precious seats at the MCG could still be up for grabs. These are the lucky ones, Crows fans with a grand final ticket to ride all the way to the MCG. Morning, Crows! Hundreds boarded the train at Keswick tonight. Destination, they hope, a back-to-back -back Premiership party. And it's been a hard night's work at the State Bank building, the Crows colours going up in anticipation of that double whammy. Earlier today, nervous punters put their hopes and their money on the block as six precious grand final tickets went up for auction. $800. I bought them on behalf of somebody else. Mm. So, so you're not going? No, I'm not going. It has snowballed a little bit. Uh, and we've had phone calls from everywhere, people looking to sell tickets that are now unable to go. Mid-City Auctions now has nearly 30 more tickets available for sale. Anyone interested can ring them to negotiate a price. The number to call is 8234 1988. At the MCG, desperate footy fanatics have already begun lining up at Gate 5. At the prospect, not all Melbourne Cricket Club members will turn up on Saturday, leaving a few precious seats free. Meanwhile, back across the border, Premier Olsen is still fuming over this week's ticket fiasco that left thousands in Adelaide on the outer. I do take issue with the process and the procedures, and surely in this modern age of technology, we can do better than this. The road to the MCG is indeed fraught with obstacles, not least the crowded highways. Today, Crows defender Ben Hart and Deputy Police Commissioner Neil McKenzie launched Operation Crow Safe. We need as many over there as we can get and uh, the, you know, the better they get over there safely, the better for us. Crazy Brave might have been the best description of this lone North supporter who dared to walk Adelaide's Mall. Not Bobby will be premier, it's 1998, hey! But of greater concern for the Crows, the silence of Sandy Perry's cockatiel, Macca, who whistles the Crows song every time Adelaide wins. Sandy, I'm a bit worried he's not uh, whistling at the moment. Well, he, he usually doesn't whistle until the day of the match. But there are two sides to every grand final, and over in enemy territory, kangaroo supporters are telling theirs. The heartland of North Melbourne. So I'm very proud to have the kangaroo scarf here, and, uh, you know, we're very proud here. Go the Reeds! We shouldn't have lost it last year, we'll win it again this year. Kangaroo fellas, yeah. not, not all out here, mate. Right? Go kangaroos! North Melbourne coach Dennis Pagan is struggling to keep a low profile. He celebrated his birthday today and isn't so sure all of Victoria is hoping the Crows will lose. I don't know if there'd be too many Collingwood supporters who'd be uh, supporting North Melbourne. At the MCG, Hunters and Collectors frontman Mark Seymour led rehearsals for the pre-match entertainment. <laughs> So the stage is set, the crowds are on their way. Tomorrow, Crows players take part in their second consecutive grand final parade through the heart of Melbourne. Another step towards inscribing their names in the history books as back-to-back -back premiers. <laughs> Philip Wilmington for Nightline. In other news, police are tonight investigating a break-in at the Perry Street office of Senator Amanda Vanstone. A cleaner had called police at around 7.30 tonight. The front door had been forced, but at this stage it's not clear what's been taken or what damage has been caused. Opposition leader Kim Beasley today continued his big push to keep unemployment in the election spotlight, declaring he'll create half a million new jobs in his first three years in office. Prime Minister Howard claimed the figure was a pipe dream. He then accused Labor of hypocrisy, challenging Mr Beasley to commit a future Labor government to repealing the GST if it's as bad as he claims. 
As the election campaign heads for its final week, it's come down to a battle between the two sides on just two issues, the GST and jobs. Kim Beasley raising the stakes, committing Labor to a target of half a million new jobs in his first term. This uh, 500,000 will start us on the road to getting to that 5% level two terms from now. Dream on, says the government, citing a business survey as evidence that figure is unachievable. 97% of the, of the employers of Australia, the job providers of Australia, saying that the Beasley target is a joke. The government also questions the value of Labor's billion dollar community jobs program. It's billion dollars is nothing more than welfare jobs and when the welfare dries up the jobs dry up. This guy is a serial defeatist, a serial underperformer. He's not prepared to make a commitment, only Labor is. As for the debate over the GST, the Prime Minister issued this challenge to Mr Beasley. If the GST is so bad, why won't you commit yourself to its repeal? And I predict now that you won't have the guts to do that. You won't. And the reason you won't is that deep down you know that it's a good idea. In fact, Kim Beasley made his position clear at his campaign launch, a point reiterated by Simon Crean. If they put it in, you can't undo it. On the economy, more generally, Shadow Treasurer Gareth Evans has given the government an unintended boost, while he claims the coalition could have done more to prepare Australia for the impact of the crisis in Asia, he admits the country isn't in bad shape. It's going to be tough, uh, the period ahead, but um, I think the Australian economy is as fundamentally sound now as it was when we, when we left it. Meanwhile, in other developments on the campaign front, Pauline Hanson has triggered angry scenes tonight as One Nation supporters clashed with demonstrators at a rally at Deniston in the heart of the Prime Minister's electorate in Sydney. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. After months of speculation, an interest rate cut could be on the way as early as next week. Share prices surged today amid signs the US may cut official rates, leading to a flow-on here. A strong, if somewhat coded, pointer to an imminent cut in US interest rates came from Alan Greenspan, head of the all-powerful Federal Reserve, as he gave evidence to a congressional committee. Action is needed to protect America against the Asian economic crisis. It is just not credible that the United States, or for that matter Europe, can remain an oasis of prosperity. That had an immediate impact on Wall Street, stocks and confidence rising strongly. A few hours later, the surge reached Japan and Australia. Financial experts here agreed that American action could lead to a fall in Australian official interest rates. If the Fed were to ease interest rates, I think that would take away one of the impediments to the Reserve Bank here, especially if it saw the dollar strengthen a little bit. As to the size of any cut, I would think they'd be looking at around half a percentage point. One Australian homeland has already jumped the gun, cutting its variable rate today to 5.65%, the lowest in the country and believed to be the lowest in 40 years. It's certainly not a fly-by-night. It is here to stay. The last time the Reserve Bank lowered interest rates was in July of last year, from 5.5% down to 5 The markets are now cautiously optimistic that another fall is due, and it could come on Tuesday week. Peter Harvey reporting for Nightline. Indonesia has tonight reportedly launched a major military offensive within East Timor. The Portuguese news agency says the aim is to finally crush East Timorese pro-independence guerrillas. In August, after the fall of President Suharto, Indonesia made a big show of withdrawing troops from the former Portuguese colony. But tonight there's talk of 20,000 Indonesian soldiers advancing on several fronts against guerrilla strongholds. Australian officials are tonight seeking urgent confirmation of the reports. Wonders, it seems, never cease in the medical world, and now we have another one to grasp. An Australian transplant surgeon, Earl Owen, working at a specialist clinic in France, has just given Perth amputee Clint Hallam the hand of a dead man. It is Sydney microsurgeon Earl Owen who hopes to make medical history by giving Clint Hallam full feeling and full movement with someone else's hand. No need to be nervous. Nowhere has this been done before, transplanting a limb from a dead person to a living one. Today's surgery went ahead at one of the world's leading transplant centres at Lyon in France. It's probably as major a breakthrough as the first heart transplant. We'll take it 
one stage at a time. This is an operation that we've been dreaming about. Clint Hellam has dreamed of again holding his wife and four children and playing the piano since a circular saw accident took his right hand 14 years ago. Though it was reattached, he had no feeling or movement. Embarrassed, frustrated, the Perth man had the hand surgically removed and began a quest for some form of medical miracle to end his personal pain. I feel, feel very humbled for having the opportunity to be the first. The operation will raise moral and ethical questions. There is no difference, Earl Owen says, between transplanting a heart and a limb. There's nothing better than to offer the hand of help to another individual. A donor was found yesterday. And so began the complex, groundbreaking operation. Eight surgeons from Italy, France and the UK worked in teams, joining bone to bone, nerves with nerves, skin with skin. The procedure was so exact, the surgeons painstakingly rehearsed for days leading up to the operation. Even where they stood and how they moved and when was crucial. After 11 hours, the operation was over. Earl Owen was exhausted, but hopeful. The recipient's done very well. We're very pleased. We've got big smiles on our face. It could be days, possibly weeks, before it's known if the operation was a success. I don't know what will happen, and we can't predict, because this is the first one. If the operation is successful, it will change Clint Hallam's life forever. It will also mean so much to so many, bringing hope to all amputees, even a baby's born without limbs. Incredible. 60 Minutes will have more on this amazing story on Sunday night, including Clive Hallam's first days of recovery. And after this short break, swim star Kieran Perkins robbed in Perth and Victoria bears the brunt of our big wet. You're watching Nightline SA Edition. And Olympic swimming champion Kieran Perkins was robbed in his Fremantle hotel room overnight but still came out ahead. In Western Australia for the Australian Short Course Championships, the swimmer remained asleep as a woman broke into his room and stole his wallet. But the 28-year-old Robert did disturb two of his Queensland teammates who gave chase and stopped her as she tried to catch a taxi. Everything was returned to the swimmer and for Kieran a bonus, an extra $70 stuffed in his wallet. Residents of Air Peninsula are on, are on alert tonight after the cryptosporidium parasite was detected in a major reservoir which supplies the region. Scientists are still conducting tests to determine if it's the toxic variety and if residents should boil their water. Recent tests have confirmed that cryptosporidium, a bug that can cause vomiting, diarrhoea and stomach upsets, is present in the Todd Reservoir. During summer, this water is vital to peninsula towns like Kimber and Sejuna, but is presently not being used. SA Water's testing the bug to see whether it's a toxic variety, as was found in Sydney's water, and is organising emergency procedures. One is to look at uh, restricting the supplies on the Air Peninsula, uh, and the other one is to potentially introduce a boil water notice. Results should be known by early next week. In the meantime, residents are being warned not to touch the water. Meanwhile, Christie's Beach is looking surprisingly clean today after 10,000 litres of raw sewage spilled from the local treatment plant during Tuesday night's storm. The spill has angered residents who say the plant must be upgraded, claiming sewage leaks happen regularly. I've been out fishing and it's raw sewage coming out and coming down the Christie Creek. SA Water admits to two other raw sewage leaks last year, but it says $34 million will be spent to upgrade the plant. Melody Horrell for Nightline. There was relief for emergency services in northeast Victoria tonight as near record floodwaters began to recede. But the floods have already caused major damage to houses, bridges and crops and forced the evacuation of dozens of families. Premier Jeff Kennett cancelled all engagements to see firsthand the devastation. Most of the damage to date appears to have been done to bridges. There are potentially six bridges that are in various stages of, uh, or stages of uh, need of substantial repair. But among the debris, defiance from a community which has seen worse and survived. We've got 13 cabins underwater of our own. Uh, another four of our vans are underwater. Toilet blocks are under. Uh, everything's under. The house survived. For some, though, it's meant days of isolation. Airborne food couriers, their only link with the outside world. I'm not far of Christmas. The focus shifted late afternoon to downstream as tons of water cascaded down the Ovens Valley. 
cutting highways in its path, the flood hit Wangaratta. The army called in to keep it at bay. Basically it's a case of we've done all, the, all that we can but we're not prepared to rest on our laurels now and let the, all the fantastic work be undone. The Ovens River at Wangaratta peaked just after 9 o'clock this evening at a height of 12.8 metres. That's more than 20 centimetres lower than the 1993 floods which devastated the region. Five kilometres of sandbags have now been laid, strengthening levee banks created in the wake of the 93 crisis. Nervous volunteers are keeping watch until the small hours, ready to plug any gaps which may appear in their only line of defence. Nick Coe for Nightline. Wilsey's here next with Adelaide's top five movies for the week and will take you to the big top. Welcome back to Nightline SA edition and to Anne Wills who joins us for Adelaide's top five movies. Nice to see you again, Diana. We've got a bit of a mixed bag this week. At number one, we've got Lethal Weapon 4. At number two, there's something about Mary. And remember, Diana, we raved about this on yes. our last show. Yes. Number three, Small Soldiers. At four, Can't Hardly Wait. And at five, Armageddon. So I think I'll go dipping into the middle of that bag and show you a little bit from Small Soldiers. It's a spin-off from Toy Story using live images with computer-generated images. And it was Phil Hartman last movie before his untimely death earlier this year. In fact, Small Soldiers has a simple dedication at the end, the words for Phil. <laughs> hey! What the heck are you? You're not like any toy I've ever seen. Come on, speak up. Greetings, Alan. Now shut up. I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. Mm hmm. I think you're smarter than you're letting on. I bet you're smart enough to get my name right. It's Alan, just plain Alan. That's all. Got it? Greetings, Alan. I knew it. I'll walk to the end of the table. Don't play dumb with me. You know what I'm saying? Alan, friend of Archer, defender of all Gorgonites, keeper of Encarta. Keeper of Encarta? You were using my computer? I find a virus in there, you're headed for the microwave. So Very intelligent little guy, that one, and, and the voice is by Frank Langella, who's a great actor anyway. Now, I couldn't let the chance go by without playing some of Lethal Weapon 4. I was hoping you would. Why did you tell me you were going to oh, shoot? Oh, shut up! Get closer! Get tied up! 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 Get tied Yes, it's it? still the same. All those yeah. people we love, of course, in the Lethal Weapon 4. Joe Pesci. Yes, he's good. And also Chris Rock drew him this time too. It's a good little film, yeah. Lethal Weapon 4. And next week we're going to be looking forward to seeing Jim Carrey's The Truman, Truman. Show in the top three, I think. Terrific. Well, mm. we'll see you then. Look forward to it. Likewise. Thanks, Dan. From the big screen to the big top, and the Moscow Circus opened in Adelaide tonight. Among those lucky enough to get a sneak preview, some local primary school kids. <laughs> Circuses have been around for more than 2,000 years and if the faces on these youngsters are any guide, the tradition lives on. The kids are from Allenby Gardens and Brompton Primary Schools and thought this was the best lesson they've had all year. And why not? They were special guests of the Moscow Circus, which is in the West Parklands until October 11. The Adelaide leg of the circus was thrown in doubt when 
Last month's wild storms in Sydney destroyed the big top. But over a million dollars later and fast work by the New Zealand manufacturers and a new big top has replaced it. There's just one complaint. They wanted volunteers. Why did they have to pick on me? I really wasn't nervous. It was just part of the act. The kids thought so anyway. Ray McGee for Nightline. Oh, that's Ray again. And I'll be back in just a moment with finance and Keith Martin's weather. While in sport, Crows captain Mark Bickley previews the grand final charge and Australia prepares for a do-or-die Davis Cup match. To sport and rookie Ben Marsh has been selected to play in Saturday's grand final against North Melbourne. Marsh comes into the 22 at the expense of Chad Rintoul. Rintoul will be an emergency along with Aaron Keating and Trent Orman-Allen. Meanwhile, if the Crows win, Captain Mark Bickley will become the first man in 43 years to win back-to-back -back premierships in his first two seasons as a captain. Mark has highlighted five key match-ups that may prove pivotal in upstaging the ruse. First use of the ball is imperative, and that means winning the ruck. Sean Wren will line up on Corey McKernan with both players in sensational form. Yeah, well, McKernan changed the whole face of the game on the weekend, so uh, uh, he's sit for him at the right time here. John Blakey always gets the tagging job on Darren Jarman and has the edge so far. But Jars only needs a few minutes to wreak havoc. The toughest job in the game of stopping Wayne Carey deserves to go to Peter Caven. And if it works, it'll free up our runners from defence. It's a big, big challenge, but you know, they've got a good side, so they, they run through Wayne, and you know, if you can nullify him to some extent, you're, you know, you're on your way. Robert Scott is expected to be given the tough task of quelling the influence of Andy McLeod. And our main target up forward in Matthew Robin will line up against his old sparring partner, Jason McCartney. I saw him out here a few weeks back, and um, he played quite well on me that night, so I hope I can turn the tables on Saturday. Our preparation remains similar to last year, even down to our wives and girlfriends travelling to Melbourne on Saturday, hopefully for the same result. Commonwealth Games gold medalist Matthew Dunn has broken the world record for the 400 metres individual medley at the Australian short course swimming titles in Perth tonight. He clipped a second off the old mark. Earlier, Ian Thorpe broke the Commonwealth record in the men's 200 metres freestyle. The Australian Davis Cup team may have back-to-back -back US Open champion Pat Rafter on board, but it's taking the lowly rated Uzbekistan very seriously in matches beginning in Townsville tomorrow. The Aussies will be relegated from the world group if they lose. Pat Rafter and Jason Stoltenberg will play the singles, the Woodies the doubles. The US Open champion will open the tie against Oleg Oregorodov, whose ranking hovers near the 200 mark but Rafter won't be taking him lightly, despite all the distractions since his major win. There are days when you can wake up on the wrong side of bed when you're playing for yourself, and sometimes you don't put in the best effort, but it, it never occurs in a Davis Cup match. Stoltenberg has first-hand experience of his opponent, Vadim Koshenko. He's carried a couple of injuries, so it's probably holding him back, but, he, but he's hit the ball real well. For the Woodies, it's been a disappointing year by their standards, not one major victory but it's been almost five years since they've been beaten at Davis Cup doubles. It's more difficult sometimes to come out and play a team like we're going to than playing against teams that we play regularly on the circuit because at least with those guys we can predict a little bit what they're going to play. With the Mildura fiasco still fresh in their minds when beaten unexpectedly by Zimbabwe, another defeat would see Australia relegated from the world group. You don't take anything lightly, um, you know, with We've had our scares. The tie to be staged in the air-conditioned Townsville Entertainment Centre has been sold out over the three days. In finance news, the Australian share market closed 41 points up today. In London tonight, gold is fetching $291 US an ounce. And in European trading, the Australian dollar is buying 58.27 US cents, 79 yen and 34 pence. Well, I hope you're keeping warm on this rather chilly night. To check out the frost factor, here's Keith.
After a very cold and frosty night, Deanna, tomorrow fine, mild and mostly sunny. Now in Adelaide today, we had a top of 14.8 degrees. That came at 10 past one. The overnight low last night, a mere 6.4 degrees, coming at 10 past six this morning. Looking at the service chart tonight, this cell of high pressure will move through overnight. So tomorrow morning, we'll be around to a northerly. Uh, so after a very cold night, tomorrow fine, mild and mostly sunny. If you're going into state, there will be some rain in Brisbane. One or two showers are likely in Sydney and in Perth. But elsewhere tomorrow, it will be dry. For our state, it is going to be a lovely day fine, mild to warm, a northerly breeze freshening in the south, seas rising to a couple of metres high in the south. Tonight widespread frosts, ultraviolet radiation levels tomorrow will be high and the pollen count tomorrow will be round about 40. Now temperatures in the northerly will be up, Mount Gambia tomorrow going for top of 17, Maitland 21, Clare 21, St Unit 27 degrees tomorrow, Broken Hill looking for top round 20, back in our state tomorrow, Narracourt 19, Port Augusta 24, Port Lincoln and Port Perry 23, Renmark and Victor Harbour tomorrow, tops around 21 degrees. For local waters, winds going around to the north, freshening early tomorrow to 15 to 20 knots, seas rising tomorrow to around about one metre high. As for the city, after a cold night, I mentioned down to five here, three at Mount Barker, top tomorrow around 21. On Saturday, an early shower, a mainly fine afternoon. Sunday will be fine and warm, more showers developing on Monday. The outlook for Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday is for the showers to clear, probably on Wednesday, but we'll tell you more about that tomorrow night. Good night to you. Thanks, Keith. And that's our bulletin for tonight. Thanks for your company. I'm Deanna Williams. Good night.